Police Commissioner orders investigation into brutality video. Governor dismayed at level of violence. And National Book Week program launched in Kerama. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Wednesday's news. Police Commissioner Gary Baki has ordered an immediate investigation into the brutal police beating of a teenager in Kimbe last weekend. A video of the beating which was posted on Facebook and shared on WhatsApp shows two armed policemen whipping the youth and stepping on his genitals. Commissioner Baki also condemned the actions of the officers. At least one eyewitness who didn't want to be named has come forward to state that this video was filmed last weekend at the Kimbe waterfront. The teenager, who is still unidentified, is understood to have been involved in a petty crime. He was caught and subsequently beaten by two policemen. The three-minute, 48-second video shows the two policemen relentlessly questioning, kicking and whipping the boy. He is later stripped and humiliated. One of the officers goes on to stomp on his genitals as the boy begs for them to stop. Police Commissioner Gary Baki, who is attending a law and order summit in Leh, said he was made aware of the incident and has seen the video. He has since ordered an immediate investigation into the beating. I condemn it. You know I always speak about public uh, police brutality. I still maintain my stand on that. Okay, any police brutality, any police behavior uh, is, uh, that comes to the attention of members of the public, then they report to the police commissioner. The commissioner gives attention to, to get it investigated. This will be investigated just like any other investigations. The two men are part of a group of police sent from Port Moresby upon orders by the commissioner. Yes, I've deployed a unit to Western Britain uh, for special operations in, in Western Britain for various reasons. And uh, uh, whether those police officers are involved in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, what is it in this beating or not? I don't know. I need to see the, the beating is the latest in a long line of police brutality cases in various parts of the country. The video has also brought strong responses from various other cabinet ministers, including the Minister for Justice. It, 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 it shows a bigger picture of a problem, a systematic problem or a cultural issue that we, we face as a country. We all uh, fathers and grandfathers. Uh, when that, that it happens, it's who can we go to? Uh, Scott Whitey, National MTV News, Lay. Meanwhile, West New Britain Governor Sassindran Mutovel is dismayed with the beating of the teenager. However, he has condemned the actions of the policemen in the video. Governor Mutovel says authorities in Kimbe will work together to address the issue and improve police behaviour in the province. And, but it's a sad uh, uh, incident happened in Western Britain and I'm ashamed that it happened in my province. And as soon as I'm back in the province and we will uh, discuss with PPC on what course of action they've taken and how we can address this issue uh, of, you know, uh, giving some trainings to uh, policemen. Uh, but uh, in these incidences, maybe police may be wrong, but... Uh, it's not they are always wrong. That it's, it's, uh, we also have people with some attitude problem have been, uh, you know, becoming the challenge uh, to uh, control our law and order situation in the province. Police Commissioner Gary Baki is expected to provide a report on the two policemen in Kimbe who were seen committing acts of violence against a young boy recently. Police Minister Jelsa Wong, who responded to public concerns on the manner in which the minor was assaulted, said he has seen the video and was sickened by the actions of the two policemen. The video, which was uploaded and shared on social media, shows two policemen in uniform repeatedly assaulting the teen while other people watched. MTV News is yet to establish why the teen was assaulted in this manner. Over 200 staff of the National Department of Health turned up at their office conference room for medical checkups. To promote a healthy workforce, this initiative gave staff the opportunity to take time off of work to have their sugar levels, blood pressure, height and weight checked by clinicians. Department Secretary Pasco Kase is inviting other departments and organizations to also do the same for their staff. All staff of the National Department of Health had the opportunity to get their blood pressure, sugar level, 
weight and height checked for free. To promote a healthy workforce, the department gave time for their employees to get checked up while at work. What initiated this uh, particular uh, program this morning is because some of our very senior health staff, uh, our health, health workers within the Department of Health have developed some lifestyle diseases and uh, our seniors including the Department of Department Secretary and uh, the senior health uh, management team felt that uh, it's important to you know check our own uh, health health workers and know their uh, you know our lifestyle Deputy Chief Surgeon Dr. Pocky mentioned that it is vital that individuals make it their business to get checked up every six months. It's a, it's a condition that is developed over time because of, uh, basically because of the lifestyle, uh, because people do not do exercise. You're probably sitting in the office most of the times. So you don't go and do uh, exercise to your uh, physical exercise to your body. People don't really look out for what they eat. So a lot of those things now contributing to high blood pressure. And not many people know that they have this. Especially Other departments and organizations are also encouraged to be a part of this initiative to help enforce a healthy workforce. We should extend this program and check our other you know, department staff in other government departments. We can extend this program to others and uh, the health team can go out to their offices and maybe Department of Finance, Treasury, what other government departments we can go out and, you know, do this uh, check. So at least... Lilian Soperakinea, National, MTV News. A bag of marijuana was confiscated this morning at the Barocco market. The bag was among other vegetable bags brought into the market by an unknown vendor. The market management has warned vendors outside Port Moresby to be careful when transporting produce into the city. The bag of marijuana was handed over to Barocco police. The bag of marijuana was intercepted at around 6 a.m. this morning by security guards at the main gate. The market management says it has been a trend where vendors bring the produce with the illicit material among vegetable bags. That a lot of local issues. That uh, one of my security guard was there and apprehend him. At the same time, I am kissing him. Same time, I walk for fight. One time, I was carrying banana bag. One time, banana compressed inside. The man uh, escaped. So I said, I mean, it's all right. There's nothing much we can do to this. All we need to do is bring it to the attention of the media and the public or some na some kind of money must go come to drive us too. Almost look at the one kind of something or carry come to market. In the near future, but we'll start charging driver where carry more this kind of line, water, this kind of sunny kind of side, inside of market. With the limited workforce manning the market gates, the suspect fought with a lone guard and managed to escape arrest. However, the bag was left behind. Well the carry more something where you know supposed to come here. The bag of marijuana was then handed to the Boroko police. The public has been warned as this is the third time such has happened. Police will be working closely with the market management to apprehend those transporting illicit materials into the city market. Jack Lopave Jr. National MTV News. 
Kerawagi district will soon realize its dreams of establishing a township. MP Barry Palmer says feasibility studies have been conducted with the help of other stakeholders, including the officers from the urbanization office. Palmer says the aim of the district administration is to create economic opportunities for people by mapping and planning government infrastructure in key areas. Kerawagi District is the first to drive the agenda of changing a rural setting into an urban township. However, a lot needs to be done to realize this dream. The move follows the provincial plan to relocate the Simbu Airport to Kerawagi. The study is completed. Uh, the detailed plan design, detailed design has been completed. The costings has all been done. Economic uh, impact assessment, social as, uh, impact assessment. Uh, everything has been done already. The civil works uh, of how, what's going to happen on this land. The visit by officers from the urbanization office brings that step closer as zoning has commenced for the establishment of government utilities. With Karawagi located along the national highway, MP Barry Palmer believes there are economic opportunities for the people. So urbanization is all about uh, bringing the, the rule setting into the into urbanization itself and that involves a lot of uh, planning and zoning and all this so i see that uh, my the economic hub that i'm trying to create in the in kerwagi uh, and the real map the map of kerwagi to be zoned into like agriculture sector into uh, conservation environment along the mountains and in the you know, into this uh, reserve forest and then into the economic zone the one to two kilometer corridor of the highway. The Office of Urbanization believes proper planning and consultation is the way forward. Director Max Cap says in a long run the plan will cater for future developments by the district. Come up with an innovative uh, uh, development model that we're going to open up our corridor and we open up our economic opportunities for the people to be more economically independent when we are economically independent, then we can be uh, independent in education, in health. We can sustain the whole operation of uh, government services to the people. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is that put money into the pocket of the small people mm -hmm. to be economically independent, to utilize the land. Jack Lopave, Jr., National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. More of the days are the stories when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. The National Department of Agriculture and Livestock is encouraging more women to take up leadership roles in agricultural and livestock activities. Speaking during APEX Women in Agriculture and Fisheries Policy Dialogue, DAL says APEC member countries should continue to work together to support women in the sector. The participants include agriculture and livestock specialists from China, Vietnam, Singapore and Russia. The National Department of Agriculture and Livestock led the discussions, highlighting the sector's priority areas in Papua New Guinea. Acting DAL Secretary Francis Dying says agriculture and fisheries are vital to the economy and focusing on better utilizing and the empowering of women and girls will generate benefits for individual countries. In Papua New Guinea, the national government is encouraging equal participation for all citizens. This includes women, youth and those living with special needs. From the discussions, the challenges and opportunities vary from one member country to the other. However, it is the increase in women participation and the impotence of working alongside men that all member countries want to see improved in their economies. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. The National Library and Archives Services Board and staff members travelled to the Gulf province to launch the opening of National Book Week there. The official launch of the program took place in Kerema town with minor gatherings held in Lesse Oalai and Terapo primary schools. A memorandum of understanding was signed during the launch for the implementation of a public library in the provincial capital and school libraries in the various districts. 
The townspeople were up bright and early attending to final touches to preparations for the launching. About eight different schools within central Kerama turned up in their various school uniform colours and traditional attire performing traditional dances way before the start of the programme. I think most important is that organising events like this, uh, National Libraries and Archives or the National Book Week, uh, creates that space for us to come out and support activities that schools and children are all around the country are doing. For three years, the team from the Office of Library and Archives has tried to branch out into the Gulf province. Without positive feedback from the previous government, it has taken them this long to finally stage this event in the province. Being the first of its kind in the whole country, the whole team comprising of staff and even board members travel together by way of showing their seriousness for such a project. The board in its last, minute, uh, last, mi last meeting made a mention that we will not go and host book weeks and come back and forget about everything. We must leave something behind. That's why we came up with an MOU that we will sign today and build library in Gulf province. Gulf Governor Chris Haiveta expressed gratitude to the Office of Library and Archives and the Education Minister for choosing his province as the pioneer province for this pilot project. The literacy level of students coming from schools in the Gulf province has proven poor. And Governor Chris Haiveta says it is part of his five-year plan to raise the standards of literacy in his province. We all know that in Gulf province our literacy rate the standards of education have hit rock bottom. Our strategy is to make sure that we bring the standards up, is to encourage reading, is to provide the infrastructure, is to encourage our children, especially young children, to read, to write, to speak, and to understand, especially from books, apart from what you learn in the classrooms. A memorandum of understanding was also signed during the launch by Director General of the Office of Library and Archives and the Gulf Provincial Government and Administration to allow for the Office of Library and Archives to extend their services to the province. This MOA paves way for libraries to be built in and around the province. Education Minister Nick Kuman declared the official launch open and challenged parents to do their part in educating their children. The intention of the National Book Week is to understand and assess and find out a way in which as a government we can be able to put those resources together and work with in partnership with at the local government level, the provincial government level, that we can be able to get those information, source of information to the schools, to the province, and even still right to the homes of every property Guinean in this country. Minister Kuman also encouraged fellow countrymen to stand together and invest in education. The event sparked a lot of excitement in the town as well as in surrounding villages that took part in the preparations with teachers looking forward to the rollout of this program. Uh, people are very happy. They, they feel that uh, you know, governor is doing the right thing for us now. Gulf Province has not had a library in so many years. Governor Haiveta said a review will be carried out in schools throughout the province to have a classroom set apart to serve as a library. The team from the Office of Library and Archives began school visitations yesterday and will continue their work in the province for the rest of the week, pointing out the importance of books to children through this year's National Book Week theme, Read, Write Forevermore. The six-week training program for elementary teachers has begun in Enga. Nearly 118 partially trained teachers now have a better chance through support from the Pogera joint venture of 150,000 kina. The program enables teachers to complete certificates of elementary teaching and become certified teachers. The training covers curriculum, pedagogy, lesson planning and the culture and character of teachers. The program is delivered in partnership with the PNG Education Institute, Education Department and Enga Provincial Education Authorities. 
Veteran PNG singer and songwriter George Telek says PNG musicians are going through a hard time trying to sell their music. Telek is calling for recognition from authorities to assist and value the work of local musicians. He says there are markets available to sell their work, but it has to be introduced and promoted. This is what it looks like in a recording studio in Papua New Guinea about five decades ago. And this is what it looks like in recent years. The trend of music has changed in this era of technology and so is its market. Veteran musician George Telek has been in the music industry for more than 40 years and he says time has changed so much that it has impacted the PNG music in a negative way. What I can experience me, before time I was money, now I was good royalty today. This once upon a time money making opportunity has become relatively worthless, the veteran singer says. But the problem doesn't stop there, it is getting more serious. We practice in time because piracy, awesome long, uh, flash drive, memory cards, all this stuff. Time we look at more planning plus song, not a song, turn the one back is him. Not all Papua New Guineans are feeling the pinch of what local musicians are going through. A combination of limited music market and copyright theft has eaten off a significant portion of the profit they once used to make, and the laws that were meant to protect them seemed not to work at all. Telek, who is slowly recovering from a mouth surgery, has joined No Drowning Waving, an Australian music band in the year 2000, with the hopes of protecting his work, some of which was sold worldwide. But he says, while moves like this can help solve piracy and promote a fair market for the music artists at an international level, local artists continue to remain unprotected. We me join up around Australia, few musicians are sympathy doing us, some like Telex says unless safety measures are taken to promote local music, copyright theft and loss of profit will continue to plague local musicians and the work they produce. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. You're watching the news on your number one to watch. We take a look at stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, 13,000 homes have been destroyed in Indonesia in the wake of Sunday's devastating earthquake which has now claimed 98 lives. Rescuers are searching for survivors and tourists are desperate to get out following the 6.9 magnitude quake. From small, humble dwellings to places of prayer, few could withstand the force in Lombok. More than 13,000 buildings are ruined on the Indonesian island east of Bali, where the impact of Sunday's powerful earthquake is still being felt as the tremors subside. Footage of the 6.9 magnitude quake reveals one quick decision can mean life or death. In this Bali mosque, they chose correctly, escaping just as the ceiling collapsed. But elsewhere, others were not so lucky. Around 100 people are dead. This man runs a Lombok shop which was full of people when the earthquake struck. Everyone started running, he says, including my brother. But as he was leaving, the electricity went off and people were shouting and running. I haven't seen him since and I suspect he was buried under the rubble. This man was pulled alive from the wreckage, trapped under a concrete wall. But even those who escaped with their lives have lost their livelihoods in the rubble. No house anymore. Just land. Rescuers urgently search for survivors. Others can only dig with their hands. The island today is desperate for help. This official says the most urgent need at this point is food, especially instant food. We need a lot because thousands are being displaced. There were scenes of chaos on the Gili Islands where more than 2,000 tourists pushed to escape, only to be stranded at Lombok Airport, tired and desperate to get back home. We just felt really big sort of shaking and then the lights went off and everyone just ran and then the roof started falling down on us rocks and rubble. The building was collapsing, so there were rocks falling on me and I was stuck. 
But leaving's no option for Lombok locals. 20,000 are homeless tonight, forced to pick up the pieces, and there are so many to rebuild their shattered lives. California is under attack. The biggest wildfire it's ever faced is still growing across the states. Around 14,000 firefighters are battling blazes with around 2,500 soldiers pulled into the fight. California is a furnace. In the north, the sky is glowing orange as a monstrous inferno sweeps through the state. An unstoppable invasion, now larger than New York City. What can you say? It makes you sick to your stomach. Everything they've worked for all their life, gone in a heartbeat. Two raging wildfires combined to create the colossal Mendocino complex fire north of San Francisco. It's the largest ever to ravage the state, destroying 75 homes and threatening 100 others. It's so big, authorities think it will burn for the rest of the month. It's devastating. It's really devastating to see. And so many people lost their homes in the back. More than a dozen fires are burning across California, fueled by high temperatures, drought conditions and strong wind. Yosemite National Park has shut down during the busy tourist season. The flames ravenous, their movements unpredictable. This fire was dictating where it went. The fire was in command. 14,000 firefighters have been deployed across the state. We're hitting it with the aircraft, uh, cooling it down, and that's uh, letting the ground crews get in there and put out the fire. They'll soon include New Zealanders who've touched down, preparing to respond to the car fire north of Sacramento. It's killed seven people so far, two of them firefighters, and destroyed more than a thousand homes. Authorities are playing a high-stakes game of whack-a-mole with new fires breaking out all the time. The newest, the holy fire, is hell on earth. Exploding in Southern California, it's only 2% contained. There's so many fires burning in the state that it's hard to get resources here. Forecasters are warning the heat isn't letting up in what really is just the start of a long fire season ahead. The sanctions President Trump has imposed on Iran have just come in effect. The White House is already warning there could be more to come. Officials say they are meant to change the Iranian regime's behavior. The Iranian regime is facing a mounting challenge from within. Images on social media show that significant anti-government protests on the streets are continuing. Demonstrators are expressing a wide range of economic and social grievances. And amid those difficulties, the White House is now following through on its promise to reimpose sanctions on Tehran. Ninety days have elapsed since President Trump ripped up the Iran nuclear deal. I am announcing today that the United States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. As part of the sequencing that followed that announcement, Trump yesterday signed into force the first wave of new sanctions. It's aimed at strangling the Iranian economy. Already the currency is losing value and inflation is rising. One sector that is being targeted is aviation. So ahead of the deadline, Iran received some new aircraft from France. But it's a small gesture that will do little to help ordinary Iranians, bracing for economic isolation. Despite all this pressure, U.S. officials say they are not trying to topple the government of Iran. Well, our policy is not regime change, but we want to put unprecedented pressure uh, on the government of Iran to change its behavior. And so far, they've shown no indication they're prepared to do that. In response, President Rouhani today gave an interview rejecting any idea of direct talks with Washington, saying you cannot negotiate with a person who has stabbed you and left the knife in your body. <laughs> America's move on sanctions is certain to deepen the rift between the US and European governments, who remain firmly committed to the nuclear deal that they all signed back in 2015, and which President Trump has unilaterally abandoned. There will also be a second wave of US sanctions which will come into force in a further 90 days. They will target oil exports, potentially delivering a crippling, even fatal blow to the Iranian economy. U.S. President Donald Trump is again sending shockwaves around the world after issuing a threat that anyone trading with Iran won't do business with the U.S. It came in a form of a tweet. 
The Iran deal was meant to ease economic sanctions in exchange for limits on its nuclear program. The Iran deal is a disaster. The Iran deal was one of the worst and most one-sided transactions. And it's a horrible agreement for the United States. But under Donald Trump, the deal was ditched. So now Iran's waking up to new sanctions imposed by the US. The more sanctions will be imposed, the harder the situation would be for people. I'm so worried about my life, future. The president's taken to Twitter saying anyone doing business with Iran will not be doing business with the United States. He says I'm asking for world peace, nothing less. So what does that mean for New Zealand? New Zealand continues to support the Iran deal uh, and we're in a position where most of our exports do fall, in, fall into the category of being humanitarian given that they are food products. Despite the very clear message in the tweet, Trade Minister David Parker says detailed policy was released at the same time. And the small print shows that most New Zealand companies will be OK. Just about everyone in the world knows the limitations of Twitter. We don't have a lot of trade with Iran, but it is important to New Zealand companies and actually any uncertainty around the world is not good for New Zealand. The European Union representative left New Zealand for Australia today. She's urging trade to continue. We are working within the European Union and with other partners in the world among them New Zealand, but also Asian partners, uh, to uh, protect investments and to keep channels open. A second round of US sanctions will kick in for Iran in three months. Doctors have found a way to heal the lungs of premature babies using stem cells from the human placenta. The discovery will help the tiny babies who are often born with a common chronic lung condition. When Harry Campbell was born, he fit into the palm of his doctor's hand. I think it was a three-person job to yeah. get him out of the incubator and onto your chest. And like many other premature babies, he was given the devastating diagnosis of chronic lung disease. In a world first, doctors have found a way to heal babies' damaged lungs by using cells from healthy placentas. The treatment works by extracting cells from the amniotic sac before administering them intravenously. As they go through the baby, it actually kickstarts the lung stem cells again and overcomes that deficit that the babies face. For Harry's mother Belinda, who was forced to deliver early due to preeclampsia, the discovery is life-changing. We found it fascinating that he was born because of a failing placenta, but that his lungs could potentially be, be cured by a, by a healthy placenta. The next phase of the trial will involve babies who haven't yet been diagnosed with lung disease but are at high risk. So this is a world first coming from Australia and it's had trickle down effects very, very quickly. Chukai Sports is next. Don't go away. Tokai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The Papua New Guinea National Rugby League competition will enter the first week of finals this weekend. The top five teams have gone through and we'll see them battle it out this weekend with the winners proceeding to the second week of finals. The grand final will be held either on the 1st or the 2nd of November. Uh, the top five will be sealed. Senga Miox, Agma Gurias, Wagitumbe, Les Next Tigers, and Bintago Gorokalanis. So that's uh, pretty much it for the finals format setups. If you see on the copy of the drawing, it was a policy we made that we'll have all the finals played in Port Mosby uh, for purpose of neutrality and making use of the facilities, the world class facilities that we have up front. Uh, we are also aware that there's a possible class on the 19th of August. That's when we have a Hunter's home game as well, thing on the winner mainly Seagulls. So uh, that decision to how we play that game uh, will come as the board meets in the next couple of days as after we final the top, uh, finalize the top final teams. But uh, the week one of the finals on 12th of August, there's no class in that, so that's a clear weekend for us, which will kick off our Digital Cup finals uh, football. The High Performance Training Centre and Peter Morrison from Sydney, Australia conducted a boxing coaching clinic this week. The clinic was attended by some of PNG's elite boxers and coaches from around the country.
The program was held to help coaches upskill their knowledge. The clinic covered footwork and other skills and techniques involved in the code of boxing. Uh, taking the coaches is on footwork, which footwork is the most uh, important part of boxing training. Which uh, we believe that, or he believed that, uh, believes that boxing, in boxing, if your footwork is right, footwork is always the foundation. Some of PNG's elite boxers also took part in the program, learning new skills. Uh, we have the athletes here, uh, all uh, uh, elite athletes, the PNG athletes, where they have uh, represented PNG in uh, uh, various uh, events, in the Commonwealth Games and the Pacific Games, also in the mini games. They are here also to learn new uh, techniques and skills. Peter Morrison from Sydney, Australia, led the clinic. Morrison was also part of Team PNG's boxing squad to the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games as the team manager. He has been uh, uh, very helpful in terms of managing the team and also uh, in terms of uh, helping the two coaches for Team PNG, myself and uh, our head coach, Mr. Joe Alpha. He's been so helpful in helping us uh, preparing our boxers as well. Coaches from other associations were also part of the program. We've start with uh, we've selected only a few coaches for a start, and this program is to help the coaches to prepare their boxes for the upcoming event, which is the national championships, and also it's the national championship is uh, basically to select boxes for the Pacific Games next year. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. Chuka Sports continues with more after these messages. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. To football after a comfort comfortable win against Tonga and topping Pool A in the opening match, the PNG under-19 side now faces a skillful side in the Tahitian outfit. Host Tahiti will be out to draw first blood, while PNG will be keen on adding points and maintain their lead. The plan that we, 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 we support. The Harrison Kamaki coach side will face a different kind of challenge when they line up against host Tahiti in their next match. However, these two sides have met before in the under-17 level early last year. But it was PNG who came out on top with credits to Jonathan Allen. And Emmanuel Simongi who were on the score sheet for PNG in the 2-1 victory. This time Tahiti will be out to prove a point and eager to draw first blood after going down to tournament giants New Zealand in their opening encounter. <laughs> PNG coach Harrison Kamaki made a couple of technical changes in his side's first game, including swapping out striker Jonathan for younger brother Abraham. Kamaki said he has a fair idea on how the Tahitians play and their opposing physicality that might cause problems for his side, but he's hopeful his players will adopt the technical approach planned for this match. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. No doubts and no regrets for rugby league superstar Billy Slater. The 35-year-old has ended months of speculation and this afternoon confirmed he will retire at the end of the NRL season. After 16 seasons, 30 tests and 31 State of Origin matches, the reigning Dally M fullback of the year has achieved everything there is to achieve in the sport. Slater paying tribute to coach Craig Bellamy. Thanks for believing in me. Your support and guidance and care has been real instrumental throughout my career. You taught me the harder you work, the luckier you get. Slater also making special mention of his family with the club acknowledging the support of his wife and two children. The Storm hoping for a fairy tale finish that would be a third Premiership title. Well, that's sad news for Melbourne Storm supporters. Now moving on to Netball and tonight is a big night with the Steels hosting the tactics in the New Zealand ANZ Netball Elimination Final. Waiting for either team in Sunday's grand final, the minor premiership champions, the Pulse. The Wellington-based franchise has been a standout, including one of the most resilient players who had to fight hard to get to the top. It hasn't been the smoothest road for Pulse mid-quarter Claire Kirsten. It's been a bit of a struggle and um, very much up and down. After breaking into the New Zealand under-21s, Kirsten had to wait until she was 24 before earning her first professional contract with the Pulse back in 2013. 
only to then spend the best part of the next two seasons on the bench. But fast forward to 2018 and Kirsten has proven to be an invaluable member of the starting seven. You sort of question whether or not it's gonna gonna work out, but the last couple of years have been have been amazing and have made those the the low points worthwhile. Sunday's grand final will mark quite a transformation for Kirsten, who switched from wing defence to centre this year. I've come from a circle D background, but obviously height's not on my side, so have had to sort of move further up the court. The feeding aspect has, has been a big focus for me. That's been the, the biggest challenge, I think, this year. Her form saw her called up to the Silver Ferns Commonwealth Games squad, and while the campaign itself may have been a disaster, the centre says she benefited from it. Yeah, there were some really tough times over there, um, but there were some great moments and um, I learned a lot from that experience on, you know, from a netball point of view, but also personally. Sunday's grand final in Palmerston North will also mark a bit of a homecoming for Kirsten, who spent most of her school years in Palmy. There is something nice about going back there and historically we play, we play well in Palmy as well, so we're actually all excited to be there and we know that the crowd will be, will be great. Now it's just a matter of finding out who she and the Pulse will be taking on. A kid growing up in Tonga, playing rugby and working as a fruit farmer, ends up being drafted by one of the most successful teams in America's NFL. So how did this all come about? And I was hoping this guy wouldn't make a play too soon, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. Peter Helmoe Pinu. <laughs> Clearly, Peter Helmoe Pinu isn't quite a household name in America yet. But this is already a dream come true for the 24-year-old. Born in Texas, his single mother had little time outside work, forcing him to spend the first 17 years of his life with his grandparents in Tonga. My mom also wanted me to uh, grow up and know the culture and know my family and know who I am as a, you know, as a man. So, yeah. Growing up working on a farm in the tiny village of Bear, he was childhood friends with all black Malakai Fikitoa. Harvesting taro and watermelon, his grandfather always said Damwe Benner would one day go back to the US and become a big sports star. You know, I laugh and I look at him and I was like, yeah, what are you talking about? <laughs> because I don't know what he's talking about. He went from a 17-year-old with no English or football skills to a star linebacker for the University of Utah. Then, last April, he was drafted by the five-time Super Bowl champions. It's crazy how uh, life just changes when you just stay consistent and keep believing. He's now a teammate of Talisman quarterback Jimmy Garoppolo and Super Bowl winning defensive back Richard Sherman. He walked up to me like, Peter, right? I was like, damn, this Hall of Fame, future Hall of Fame guy, know my name? I mean... That's crazy. So far, Dalmoy Bennell's only played preseason games. On Friday, he'll get another chance to impress against the Cowboys in this year's preseason opener. I couldn't believe that I made it this far, so I'll just keep continue to keep working hard. And continuing the dream of his late grandfather, who never got to see it all come to fruition. And that ends your guys' sports up next. The weather details for the next 24 hours. Okay, sports. True Kai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. Quick look at the weather forecast for this afternoon and tonight in the southern region, mostly fine all across the region. In the Mamasi region, cloudy at times in Medang. In the New Guinea Islands region, a shower or two in Lorengau and Buka. And in the Highlands region, a few showers in Mendy and Wabag. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's been the news, sports and weather for today, Wednesday the 8th of August 2018. On behalf of the entire MTV news team around the country, pleasant viewing. Good night.